Now please welcome Mitch Frazier, Chief Executive Officer, Reynolds Farm Equipment. Troy Fichter, Chief Executive Officer, Agnext. James Klein, Farmer, Klein Family Farms. And Alex Whitley, Head of Marketing, Tyrannus. Gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. So good to see you. And uh, how about a round of applause for Paul, the team from Forbes, Agrinovis, Indiana, and IEDC? <laughs> Incredible. Absolutely incredible to see the amount of talent, the amount of energy, the amount of passion in one place on the future of agriculture. As we look through what we've seen today, it's super clear, super clear that the future foundation of where we're headed is all built on technology, especially when it comes to agriculture. When we look at where we're headed and where we're going, gentlemen, you each represent a unique piece of the agricultural, agricultural puzzle. And I think as we zoom way out, and we've done it in an amazing fashion today, we've seen some incredible companies, great technologies. Technology is incredibly innovative, and technologies that I would argue are disruptive. And we see them all out there, and in fact, uh, I've seen both of you guys out there at your booths. Here's the challenge. The challenge that we have out in that booth, the folks joining us online and the folks in this room is this. It's not just about how do we find great technologies to apply to agriculture. It's about how do we find those great technologies that actually drive the income statements and the balance sheets of American farmers. <clears throat> Today we're going to spend some time, gentlemen, we're going to dig into that. We're going to look specifically, we're going to bring it down from the big stories we've heard all day and bring it down to what it really means in the farms and in the fields of America and what ag tech actually means. Jim, I'd love to start with you and we're going to have a discussion here, gents, and then as we get toward the end, we're going to open it up for questions from the audience. Jim, you are an incredible row crop farmer here in Indiana. Fun to come out and spend some time on your farm and see what you're up to. I, I think before we jump into the future of ag and the future of ag tech, I think it's really helpful we paint a picture on where we are. So I'd love to hear maybe if you could just give us current state of the talent in ag, the technology in ag, and maybe help us paint a picture on where that's evolved over time. Okay. Uh, first, Mitch, I'd like to thank Forbes and you for inviting me to participate in this summit. It's uh, very humbling and uh, it's an honor. Uh, to get back to your question, I think uh, I may have to revert back more than just 10 years. Sure. Uh, and in my career, there were two very distinct advances in technology that really moved the industry forward. One was in the mid-70s and the other was in the mid-90s. One was through an engineering, uh, it happened to be through John Deere, an engineering of 7,000 planter. And the other was uh, genetically modified seeds. Both uh, revolutionized agriculture. And a lot of times I'll uh, use a, uh, uh, an example of a painter and try to correspond that with what we're doing on the farm. And that painter's portrait was originally, in my career, painted in the field. Ninety percent of that was done at the field level. To where we are today, and today, fifty percent of it's done in the office. And where what I see has changed is in about 2010, we had an abundance of information, just reams and reams of information, because we had the ability to collect it finally, and not only collect it, but collect it accurately, so we could get something from it. And I'm an economist first and a farmer second, so I was trying to figure out how are we going to make this pay? How, right, what, what, how can we use it for an advancement of the farm? And what we found is we were very fortunate Within a few years, we had different seed companies that were trying to develop software, and we also had independents that were developing software. And we were fortunate enough to be asked by Granular to be one of the first eight teams to participate in their pilot program. With that, we were able to start collecting this information and use it for the benefit of the farm. Uh, we were able to fine tune and uh, use filters so that when you looked at the top 15, 20% of our farms, why were they the top 15 or 
and what differentiated them from our lower farms? And oh, by the way, are we really making any money having those lower farms? Or should we right. uh, offer lower rent or try to figure out a way of making those profitable? So that's what the real advantage to this, soft, this software has added to us. And I think, Jim, when you know, we spent time out on your place, one thing I was blown away by, and Alex, I want you to spend some time on this because I think this will really weave in well here, is Jim, you had help wanted signs literally on every corner. As I made my way to your farm, Klein Farms now hiring. And I think that we heard it a bit from uh, Kip earlier where this, this idea of talent is a real challenge. And I think talent is a catalyst for ag tech. And Alex, look, when I met your team over in uh, Tel Aviv, it was amazing, right? I mean, we heard the things that everyone wants to hear when they talk about talent, scale, predictability, all the things that ag tech promises. I'd love to hear from you as you dig into ag tech, you spend time in ag tech, you're an ag tech veteran, where do you see this opportunity for technology and talent to come together to shape the future of farming? I think it's never been more exciting than right now. We hear actually in several um, of the speeches today and panels today, we heard about machine learning right. as a future innovation. Machine learning is the future, but the future is right now. And what we do at Tyrannus is the application of machine learning. And we provide analytics on fields down to the leaf level. So whether you are a farmer in Mooresville, I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana, so I'm very familiar with this area if any of you are fellow Hoosiers. Um, we want a farmer in Mooresville, Indiana, who manages 500 acres to be able to benefit from our product just like a giant ag retailer managing 10 million acres. And we want the process to be the same from a product standpoint. And we want you to be able to get anywhere you go with one or two clicks. And when we're talking about this idea of talent, the intersection of talent and technology, is in the past, and you give great history, and you're right, we had these super agronomists holding the keys to all the innovation. And we had them holding the keys uh, from ag retail service providers uh, down to large farming operations. They had one person holding onto this. Now, it was great because they were really psyched on the product and knew how to use it, but it wasn't being distributed. And you also needed to be either a super agronomist, like they were, or you needed to be a computer programmer. What we're doing now through machine learning is eliminating that barrier of entry. You no longer have to be a uh, computer engineer to be a precision agronomy user and someone who benefits from it. If you manage 10 million acres, we have developed a way that in two clicks, you can get down to those 10% uh, worst performing fields. You can get up to those top 10% performing fields and it, over an entire geography. And then from there, all in the same time, get down to the leaf level and decide and visually see we have a nematode problem. And as a matter of fact, it's over the threshold, so we need to go out for an application. And of course, we have products that support all of those things. Um, but the, mo the, the biggest thing that I'm excited about is the accessibility that we have, we have created. Um, it's no, we, no longer do you have to have a extremely special knowledge base to be able to benefit uh, from some really important and cutting edge technology. I think President Daniels hit it well when he talked about the democratization. And when we look at ag tech, and we look specifically at that democratization, and what does it mean for net farm income? Mm -hmm. right? How does your technology actually improve net farm income? And one of the things we talked about as we got ready for today and we got together on the phone was this idea of ag tech has to evolve, and we have to get to a place where we're talking about net not need, right? We're, we're talking about how does it drive net income? How does it drive net farm income? Not just new novel graphs, new novel reports, but how does it create actionable insights to actually go do something that drives net income to the farm? And Troy, I, I'd love to hear you talk through this, right? You're, you've been out sampling, love to hear more about Agnex, but you've been out sampling, you've been out spending time in the field with producers. When you're talking about tech, when they, you see that robot, you, you have to think technology. What are you hearing from producers when they say, hey, this is what I want today from ag tech, and this is where I think it's headed? 
Yeah, maybe it'd be a good time to just play the video. Yeah, let's take a look. <clears throat> So that is what I do. <laughs> I, I am a farmer, and that is a real technology that we can actually apply to the farm. And I hope none of you guys are like, wow, that's a cool little robot. It doesn't have anybody in there. It actually is like the first commercial autonomous vehicle, and it's actually being used as a service in agriculture. But we're just trying to solve a problem, and that's all it is. The value proposition is we want to go back to the exact same core year after year and take the right extraction amount. It's as simple as that. And the reason, because, because we want to do that, we want better data on our farm. We already have too much data, and some of it isn't actually good data. And so the place to start is to start getting good data in our farm. And that's, where, that's, that's why it began. So. Yeah, I think the idea of turning that into actionable insight to go do something with is critically important. Back to that net, not neat idea. Yeah, it's neat, but it's also driving net. And Jim, that's where I think you as a producer, in it every day you see this. It was fun when I first met you. I, I came in and we started chatting about all things ag tech. And uh, we both got pretty excited pretty quick. And then you said, I got to go get somebody else. And so we go to the boardroom and uh, in comes your CFO, Mitch, which he's got to be a good guy if his name's Mitch, right? <laughs> uh, but what I loved was, here he is. One, you have a CFO on the farm. That's pretty interesting. Two, he walks in and he has an Indigo hat on. So I'm, okay, now, now I'm feeling good. We're talking tech. You're a John Deere farmer using operations center. All these things are great. And then I come to find out you were a pioneer with Granular, right? A, a guy that who is adopting and standardizing the farm on granular to get to net income by farm. I'd love to hear how you evaluate investments in technology, and I know that uh, that initial investment or that initial analysis may be different than how it evolves over time. So maybe if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, I think we're focusing much more from a uh, financial basis at this point. Because of the economic crunch that we're experiencing right now, every dollar that we spend, when we review our budget at the beginning of the year, we look at, okay, we have this much money to spend. Where's our return going to be the greatest? Right. And right now, I think it's in evaluating uh, all the information. I felt like that about 2010, that the difference between the farms that were going to be very successful and the ones that may just be average, six, uh, have an average success was going to be how well we interpreted this information and how well we used it. And there's so much information, you can't wrap your head around it. You have to be able to organize it through a software program so that you can ask the questions and get immediate answers. We currently, you asked the question earlier about what we're doing with our labor force, okay? We presently, 50% of our labor is probably spent in the office. Huh. So uh, it's, I think you'll be, many people will be surprised. We have an on-staff agronomist that basically works in the, in the office. Uh, we have a CFO. Uh, we also hire an agronomist to help our agronomist, but they're always looking at information and how can we better our position. And so when we're looking at where we're investing, yes, we're still looking at uh, equipment, but an overwhelming amount of that is we're, we're evaluating where our money's going as far as the return and uh, our software that we've that we have uh, using granular extensive. On the time horizon, I think this is really important as we think about net not neat, getting to that net farm income and making those investment decisions. How are you looking? I'd love to hear everybody. Jim, we'll keep going with you and then kind of go around the table here. How do you look at time horizon? Do you need to see that payback in year one or is it a constant evolution? Well, obviously with a lot of these things, it's a long-term investment. Sure. You're not going to see the return in year one, year two, or year three. Matter of fact, we've been with Granular, I think, five years, uh, basically since the inception. And we are finally getting to the place where we're able to 
collect information that we can actually use to make economic decisions, sound economic decisions. And Alex, what are you hearing? I actually had a question. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so then what was the value prop for you as a grower to say, hey, there's not going to be an ROI for maybe five years? What was the value prop for you to say, I get it, I want to be part of this, and I see where this is going to save money for me long term? Or I'm going to produce an ROI off of this? I just think it, 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 for us, it had to be with the overwhelming amount of information before us. We could not, we could not figure that out. It was just too overwhelming. Yep. And, but I also felt after talking with them and their reason for doing this, and, and, and we had looked at this for a long time, trying to figure out a way to do this, and I just felt like that long term, we were going to be able to make decisions. Okay? Uh, one of the things we've done on our farm is uh, yeah, we're growing, but at the same time, we're looking at alternative crops. So, you know, what's going to make us different than, than the farmer next to us? Uh, one of the things we're doing is we're raising seed. So we're trying to raise value-added crops, so we're raising seed. We're uh, transitioning crops to or some ground to organic. Mm -hmm. And so all those things, we're getting answers back because of the information we're putting in. I mean, we have the ability now to know what tractor, what it's pulling, what time of day, who the operator is, um, what they're applying, not only what seed, but what rate on a specific part of the field. Mm -hmm. So we're able to track all that. I think that's good from an environmental standpoint. I think it's making us better stewards. Uh, we've already been able to as well. Uh, we've been variable rating our nitrogen. So we're using about two-thirds the amount of nitrogen that we did four years ago and raising just as good or better crops. And so it's been a savings. It's been an improvement to the environment as well. So there's, those are just some of the reasons. Mm -hmm. But we have also invested more money in labor outside of the farm. And when you asked about our, our signs, it's made it really difficult for us to uh, find labor because we have two people come to us. We have people who are 55, 60 years old that have experience of driving tractors, but they don't understand there are two, three, four devices within that cab right. that they don't have the ability, it scares them, they don't have the ability to run that. Or we get the younger generation that hasn't had the luxury of being able to operate this equipment, but they understand the technology fairly well. They can pick it up. So we'll spend, when I started farming, we spent four or five, maybe six hours training somebody to run a piece of equipment. Now we spend a season before they're what we feel like quite adequate operators. I guess I'd love to hear from your perspective, Alex, we'll start with you. When it comes to evaluation of ag tech, right, getting back to how do we drive net farm income, what success measures are you seeing from growers in looking at their investments in ag tech? How are they thinking about those investments and how are they using data metrics to be able to say, yes, good investment, or hey, we're going to pass? It's a good question. <clears throat> I think how we're seeing that now is we have this philosophy change of where there was a big focus on nickel and dime. Let's take nitrogen, for instance, big nickel and diming. I'm going to save five cents on nitrogen this year. I'm going to spend four, uh, I'm going to save 50 cents on potash this year per acre. Um, where a lot of the, the big elephant in the room was logistics. How many times are you really running that machine over the field? How many people are you sending out? How long is it taking to send these people out? And um, logistically, especially if you're looking at ag retail uh, or service providers that are servicing millions of acres, there are so many moving parts there and so little consistency of quality and value that we can start uh, replacing that at a much lower investment um, and at more consistent and higher uh, sample densities. And that's what we're out there doing, and that's the value that uh, the growers and the service providers that are delivering the service to the growers are doing. But it's been taking a, a bit of um, uh, swallowing a tough pill because they have to realize, hey, I can do a whole lot of work from this computer, uh, and I don't need a, a really tough degree anymore to do that. And uh, the, the quality here is, is better than what I can do in the field. 
Does that mean it's better than um, what an agronomist can provide holistically? No, but what it does mean is that that agronomist can get their agronomy out there on more and more acres and leverage this technology to help them do it better at a lower cost. And that, of course, always goes down to the grower. For sure. And Troy, you and I were talking about this out front, is this idea of ag tech getting to scale, right? And, and you may not end up covering necessarily more acres for the agronomist, actually boots and field, but what you may be able to do is highlight hotspots and truly use technology to scale people. Any thoughts on metrics, Troy? Yeah, I think farmers tend to go towards things that reduce their costs and instead of like increase yield, increasing yield isn't actually as big of a deal as it was when corn was seven bucks. And so actually our farm's like, okay, we can measure a reduced cost. When we go to a farm show, we look at things that will actually optimize the process. Sure. And I think that's the difference between a successful farmer and a non-successful farmer, or an average farmer, is one guy's just a tinker, and he just tries to find little things that just boost this and that, because he just has a need for that kind of stuff. Right. But one the successful guy is actually going out there and optimizing a process, streamlining his harvest, streamlining his planting, and making decisions upon 10% of the data that he has. We don't have to have all the data. We have to have good data, and we've got to make decisions fast. The problem that I see, um, and this is because maybe I'm un uneducated, but on our farm, an agronomist <laughs> tends to be somebody who can actually create a VRT map. Like right now, I can create a VRT map, and I'm like jumping because I actually got it to be in the right format for a John Deere monitor or whatever like that. It's like I got the right shape file. It's like no, my mental energy needs to go into what that actual, what the actual prescription is in that VRT map. So we got to get the simple. We got to get this. I don't like iPads, but we got to get it as simple as an iPad. Yep. And um, we measure that by doing test strips. Like we don't have to have big statistical data sets that say information that we don't understand, just do test strips and right. isolate your variables. Like our farm, we went from variable rate technology, now we're actually gonna go back to straight rate technology. I know it's like oh. against what everybody is saying in here, but we have to start isolating our variables for a few years to create a baseline of what we're actually learning. We don't know what we're learning. Yeah, this is the ultimate multivariable question, right? I mean, when, when you look yeah. at modern agriculture, it is the, the most challenging multivariable story problem that exists with the complexity of you don't control any of the variables but a couple, right? I mean, that, that is the reality of what we have. I do think there's some interesting here as we unpack this a bit and we talk about the application of ag tech. We think about technology broadly, right? Let's step out of ag for just a moment. Scale, predictability, talent optimization, all the things we've talked about, we could take literally any technology that exists on the planet and say, boy, that fits. As we think about ag tech broadly, and we'd love to hear from everybody here on the panel, as we think about ag tech broadly, where are we in this cycle, right? In every segment of the economy, what we see is point solutions becoming platforms, right? We see a discrete problem being solved by a discrete solution that then gets a little broader to solve maybe a more macro problem, that then a couple of those get stitched together to solve maybe a more macro problem, and then those get stitched together to become a platform for management and execution. Would love to hear your thoughts. Where are we in ag tech? Are we still in point solution era, and there's still a lot of greenfield there? Or have we got to a place where we're starting to get to platforms of record for ag? Maybe, Alex, we'll start with you. I think we've never been so far than we are now. I think that, like I said in the beginning, the future is here, um, with especially what we're doing with machine learning. Uh, actually, let's, for example, take uh, ag imagery, which has been sore to catch on because we're focusing what's right in front of our face, this red to green map. Have you ever planted anything that is red? <laughs> Maybe <Or> tomatoes? <laughs> <laughs> so when you show a, a grower, here's this red to green map, aren't you really excited you paid $2 for it? They're not excited, right? They want to say, that doesn't look like anything I plant. I, all I care about, in Indiana here, you, all I care about is tall green corn, am I making money, and do I have a high yield, right? So if we can stop focusing on what's right in front of our face, extract the data from, which is the real usability of these images, extract those data, do all that heavy lifting. You were just mentioning how difficult it is to create a variable rate map based on in-season data. 
if you could automate that whole system at something uh, at a price that is more affordable than uh, filling up a tank of gas, now we're really onto something. And that's what we're doing. And then beyond that, the missing component in ag imagery has been ground truth. And you still got to go out there and figure out what the heck red means and green means to appropriate that to the values. Now, having leaf level analytics and leveraging all of this machine learning, we can do that. So what you're wanting to do with, uh, you want to get down to the application, that's where the money's at, right? And that's what matters and that's what's going to protect yield uh, if we have an issue going on or it's going to uh, you know, Im improve your yield that's already out there. Um, if we're able to give you that in a cost-effective way, all wrapped up, you're not necessarily uh, excited about A, B, C, D, E. You just want to get to Z, right? So we need to start, f uh, from a product perspective, stop looking at everything in the middle and deliver to you what it is you want. And that brings up another interesting thing, because data sizes get a lot smaller, and we are no longer uh, bogged down by these enormous uh, processing costs and prices associated with storage. If we get away from looking at the process and are delivering the output, we're going to solve a whole lot of problems, and we're really close to doing that. Troy, point or platform? Where are we? Yeah, I, th I still think we're at point. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just struggle so much creating VRT maps. I, uh, <laughs> But I do think that we are getting there. I, I do think like Beck's farm server is, is not doing everything, but they're, they understand farmers better than about any other group of people. And so I like it whenever people that are really talented collaborate with a group like that to actually create a viable product for people like me and Jim who literally just want to select our field and be like, okay, here's our seed selection tool, create a VRT map, send it to the planner, and then, and then monitor it in real time, and, and then be able to overlay data sets and be like, okay, we're trying to create a management zone. All I want to do is overlay my, how my moisture is moving through my soil. How is my yield affecting? Oh, is that affecting because I variable rated the, the seeding population or my fertility population? And then you want to isolate, pull back. I can't do that. Actually, I can do that, but you got to mess around with SMS for about a year in order to figure it out. In a world of finite resources, right? Yeah, so I, I think we're in points solution, but I think we're getting there. I think there's good people that are actually working really hard at it. Okay, we're going to take some questions, but uh, real quick rapid fire. I've got two questions for you, gents, before we open it up to questions. Jim, we're going to start with you. As a producer today, you see every element of the operation, right? You see every element of farm, and my hunch is, is you've probably had calls, emails, or something from everybody out there in the lobby and everybody that's watching this online. Where do you see the greatest opportunity for ag tech that is really being unserved today? Oh, that's, I think that's an easy answer, Mitch, at least this for our operation. With the problems we're having finding labor, uh, I think it will be uh, driverless tractors. I think it'll be autonomized implements. I mean, we already know John Deere and their 7,000 or the 700 series combines. It's already automated. You don't have to have someone make the changes on the combine to, to for seed quality. They're doing it for you, so it's taking a lot of the responsibility off the operator. So I, I definitely feel that it's going to be uh, in that type of a... Okay. Alex? Um, I agree with automation completely. I think that's exactly where it's going. And I think you're going to see a whole lot of processes that are now individual... Um, processes and products are going to be consolidated into one, uh, one pass. So it can be something from taking soil samples to grabbing aerial imagery to do the analysis, to produce the recommendation to an aerial or ground application, but that occurs in one motion. Right. I totally agree. Troy, my hunch is you might say automation given what you do, but uh, <laughs> any additional? It's harder than you think. <laughs> And I don't actually think it's hard. Be, it's, it's easy to make a, drive, a tractor drive itself. I don't put my brother Darren in the corn planter because he's good at driving a tractor. I put my brother Darren in the corn planter because he knows what's going on back there. The hardest thing, between, the barrier between autonomous vehicles in the field, actually getting in the farm, is 
machine to implement interface. Okay. We need to, and I've been in hog barns where I've done technology studies and I've, all I've done is unhook sensors because all they do is cause problems. So it's not like you just put more and more sensors on there, but we need to be very, very intimate with the actual process that's being done and with the farmer to come up with practical solutions to make autonomous vehicles and um, but I think the, the, most, the most tangible uh, problem that we have that's in front of us today on our farm, it's just my perspective, sure. okay, is I just don't know if we're doing the learning that we need to do with all the data we have. We actually have equipment to do almost anything we want, things that I can imagine. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't feel confident in all the data, and that's, that's why we started with our soil sampling data. We had agronomists say, well, we're, we're doing your... Um, VRT recommendations based upon the last four times that you sampled that field because we want to see how it's changing. I'm like, well, sure. you can't see how it's changing based upon how you just sampled that field because I've sampled the same field in the same, same hour and just you know, kept my depth the same, moved at 25 feet, created a whole different map. Right. But if we're more consistent, I can actually create repeatable data. Still room to grow on data science. Yeah, right? I'm still data, yeah. <laughs> Time real quick for a couple questions. Anyone? If not, I'm going to do a real quick round of Robin because I see that uh, we're at zero on our clock. So, gentlemen, here's the deal. Uh, you two can't say your own technology. Fair? I'm going to ask you a question here. I want to know the... <laughs> yeah, I know. You're saying no. <laughs> so, back to this idea of how do we drive net farm income. Net, not neat, right? How do we drive net farm income from ag tech? What's the one technology that you're most optimistic about? Jim, we'll start with you. Well, I think we're already using it. I mean... In gathering information from the information we already have. Alex? More of a process, but I'm going to say machine learning. Troy? You won't like this, but I think the biggest value on the farm is a tile plow and a manure spreader. <laughs> you can fix a lot of problems with a tile plow and a manure spreader. <laughs> I don't know how we end an ag tech uh, panel like that, but please help me uh, thank the panel here. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you.